Hi, Sebastian. How are you doing? Very good. How about you? Very good. Thanks for coming for uh, TEDx Luxembourg City Presents Coffee With, and in this case, Sebastian Bellin. It's, uh, it's really nice to have you, uh, have you on the series. Uh, Sebastian, I, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to just quickly kind of tell people where it is that, that we met and, you know, how it is that you came about doing a, a TED talk at, uh, at TEDx with us. Um, so we, we kind of, well, I heard a lot about you um, on the news. I saw some pretty, uh, well, I hope you don't mind me saying shocking, gruesome images um after the terrorist attacks here in here in brussels and um it was it was a, a shocking situation the whole thing and when it happened you know i got the ted team together i said well what should we do ted talks about and one of the teams said hey listen you know that guy that's all over the news well you know he's he's talking about it so how about we go and contact him and um so we did and and you came and and you gave a ted talk now I'm going to let people a little bit behind the scenes. Um, you came and gave a TED talk with us uh, uh, quite a while ago. So is it sort of four years ago, I think? Yeah, I think, yeah. I think it was 2016, like at the That's, end of the year. Right, right. And so, and so you, you got up on stage and the, the concept was great and what you were going to talk about was really good, but TED talks are pretty emotional things anyway, right? Do you want, do you want to talk a little bit about how that happened? Yeah, I think I think we had like we had um, we had prepped for this talk like many 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 times, and we had practiced and everything. And it was it was pretty um, you know there there's a there's a video that I show in my TED talks that's pretty uh, it puts me back in that place every time in in, in on March twenty second you know at the airport, and so it kind of just. Uh, I think it was the day before we were we were rehearsing. You know, there's always for when you do a TED talk, you you rehearse, and it, it kind of just I don't know nothing, um, not, nothing flowed. It, I just locked up, and it was I was like I'm not, um, this is not me. You know, this is not uh, I'm not a structured um, the, the kind of the talk where everything kind of uh, is planned out. So I basically I remember um, just walking off the stage. <laughs> And kind of ripping up like the pieces of paper and everything, and said, "Ah, oh, screw this! I'm uh, I'm coming back tomorrow." And I literally just went back to uh, to my room, to the hotel room, and I was just, you know, I think I went for a run or something, and uh, just uh, just kind of, yeah, in my mind, um, kind of threw everything out the door that we had planned. <laughs> So, and but just you went were back you the were, next day. but you were you were good enough to come back the next day and get up on stage and give a genuinely heartfelt account of yeah. what happened. Um, yeah. But I I know That's it wasn't I mean. it wasn't the TED talk that you wanted it to be. So we invited you back a couple of years later to give the talk um, that you wanted to give, and so that was just last year, and um, and it was an amazing talk. So for those that haven't seen it. I'll, uh, I'll link here below um, the the link of the YouTube clip on the TEDx YouTube channel. And I certainly recommend you go and see it. When you go and watch it for those first five minutes, I think everybody that watches it is gonna need a tissue. It was a, it's a difficult thing to watch, certainly. Do you wanna tell us a little bit, for those that haven't seen it, do you wanna tell us a little bit about uh, what happened? And so, you know, what, what brought you to this place? Because I, I guess nobody knows your background, or some people won't know your background yet. Yeah. I mean, they, um, you know, I, I played, I played, uh, 15, 15 years professional basketball and I was caught up at, uh, I was caught up on, on, on March 22nd. I was about 10 meters away from the second bomb at Zaventem airport. And I was traveling on business. I had, uh, with two buddies of mine, we had started a, a little company that we had sold in less than three years. And we opened offices in New York and I started traveling back and forth. And uh, anyways, I, I, I found myself at the airport. The first bomb went off behind me and I started running for my life. Um, and so I didn't know that I was actually running right towards the second terrorist that was coming my way. A uh, bomb blows up and I, I find myself almost both my legs, you know, blown off. And um, from that moment on, um, you know, in, in a, 
in a kind of a split second, I, I go from being a professional athlete who's dedicated my life to, you know, um, the, reaching the top of physical ability um, to all of a sudden being handicapped for the rest of my life. So I no longer, I no longer have uh, any feeling in my left leg. So from the knee down, you know, I don't, I, I don't, I don't feel anything. And in, uh, I have metal, my, my left tibia is all metal and my right femur is connected to my hip by, by metal. So um, it, it changed my life, but it's that journey. Uh, it's the journey of going from, you know, of a handicap. To me, a handicap is not a dirty word. You know, it's, it's something that can be, it's like golf. It's something that can be improved. I don't know how many golfers actually improve, but anyways, I use the imagery of, of a golfing handicap where you can improve a handicap. So it's so the I, journey, yeah. Yeah, so, so I, I guess people may be slightly surprised to say that, you know, almost both your legs were taken off. And, uh, and by the way, again, you know, please, if you haven't seen it, go and watch this video. Um, it's, it's just, you know, the first five minutes is that recording the footage of what happened. And it, it, is, it is absolutely mind blowing. But, but so you just said, you know, your, your legs were unbelievably damaged, um, handicapped. But rewind sort of two minutes, you were talking about going for a run. So, so how does that happen? How do you go from almost having two legs completely gone to going for a run? Yeah, well, well you know, I, I was on a hospital bed for four months and I, I couldn't move. And there was, you know, there, there was a lot of debate whether they should go through uh, the surgeries, that, that uh, the protocol, there was a... Um, I had really big open wounds in both legs. So the risk, risk of infection, especially in the left leg was huge. A lot of uh, surgeons didn't feel comfortable putting metal in. So they thought amputation was a much more safer, uh, or, or, um, let's say approach or protocol. So in, in many ways on that hospital bed, I needed a kind of, a, um, I needed something to focus on. I needed a, a uh, something to keep me from going insane, you know, not being able to move, not being, and, I just started dreaming up of one day running an Ironman, of doing an Ironman. Like I, I thought of the hardest endurance race in the world <laughs> and it was Kona, Hawaii. And I just said, okay, well, one day I'm going to do it. I don't win, but I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that with both my legs. And okay, so but, that's wait, really wait, the wait. journey I'm on. <laughs> so, so, uh, so you're in a hospital bed. You, you, you can't, you can't, well, well you, you can hardly move your legs and you decide I'm not going to run a marathon. That's that's not that's not good enough. You decide. That was the first step. That, that was the first step. <laughs> <laughs> but but your focus is is I'm just going to do the Ironman and and so the Ironman in Hawaii, I think Kona, right? That's yeah. That, that's kind of the biggest in the world, isn't it? That's the most reputable, I think. Yeah, yeah. That's the World Championships. It's the World Championships, and it's where I guess uh, all, all the all the yeah all the all the. Uh, all the attention for Ironman events goes. And I'm actually, this year, I'm, a, I'm an Ironman ambassador. So, so um, the journey has become a, uh, we're, we're filming a documentary. So the, we've sold it to VRT, which is the, 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 the biggest, uh, I, I would say, Belgian broadcaster. And they're going, to, they're going to show it for the five-year anniversary of the Brussels attack. So in, in March, 2021. And so, you know, for, for, for many, uh, March 22nd is the equivalent of 9-11 in the States. You know, it, it, it fundamentally rocked this little country. And so I wanted to, I wanted to really um, kind of honor uh, that day and, and that, that event um, by, doing something, by doing something really positive, by, by making the switch from, from, um, from something negative and recycling into something positive. And so I've created a team around me, you know, my coach is Luke Van Lierde, um, who's, who, who he himself is a, uh, a two-time world champion. So he, he's won Kona two times as, as a pro. And so Luke is part of the team and I have uh, just really great, great technologies, you know, little companies that, that are helping me with their, uh, with their new approaches. And it's, it's called Team Bellin. And so it's, it's this journey uh, of a handicapped athlete uh, of achieving one of the hardest endurance races in uh, in less than seventeen in less than seventeen hours. 
So, so how did you get to that point? So you, you're in a you're in a hospital bed. You're you're you've decided you're going to recover. You've decided to set yourself a goal. I assume you didn't share with the doctors. My goal is going to be to run an Ironman. I assume your doctors were just concerned about getting you up on your on your feet. Uh, but but so so you start training uh, as a professional basketball player. Obviously, you know what that is and and how that uh, how how difficult that is. But it's clearly, you have that focus. Um, but then you decided to to make a documentary about it. So was that was that something you decided, or was that did you notice there was a lot of interest in what you were doing? Well, I, I you know the uh, I started um, I guess my my life and experiences um, where what I've learned along the way I, I kind of put into a TED talk, you know, right. which which I did last year uh, in a few months ago in in, in Luxembourg. Um, and it, it's called the four pillars and this journey has kind of, uh, you know, a lot of people ask me, yeah, well, w w did you always think this way? Um, and I always respond. I said, I, I kind of thought that I've always thought those things, but there was a kind of all mumbo jumbo in my head. Right. <laughs> and, and this, this last kind of major experience in this journey to Kona has really engraved it, you know, uh, has made it very clear, the four pillars. And one of the things that I see, um, what I talk about in my talk, is the difference between danger and fear. And, and, and I see that being a lot more relevant every day, not only in businesses, but mostly in people. You know, we live in a society where, and, and, and it, might, it might not be visible, but I believe that fear is more and more dominant. People are scared. Um, people are, are worried, people are anxious. The, and the fear is driving decision making, um, and, and I make the parallels, and and the, uh, the um, I point out the difference between fear and danger, right. and that's that's the real powerful, I guess, one of the four pillars is when you make that realization that we control fear. A fear is an illusion, you know, it it exists in our minds, and if we are not in danger, the only place fear can exist is truly in your mind. Right. And so making that distinction between fear and danger, it's like going to the mental weight room. Uh, it's, it's like a fitness, fitness session where if you're not in danger, um, then you realize that the fear uh, can be eliminated. And it's a process every single day where, okay, you, you are aware that you're not in danger. So you look around you and say, okay, there's no car coming at me full speed. So the fear of thinking, oh, today I'm going to get hit by a car. Well, the only place if you're not in danger that can exist is in your mind. Right. And so little by little, you know, I, I find that that's, it, it sounds very simplistic, but the four pillars in a time of so much complication is a very simple approach, very um, easily um, in, uh, kind of, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's easy to explain it. It's right. so simple. And I, I find that with a lot of people, I just did a talk uh, last week to uh, Indeed, Indeed.com, and they were, you know, it's, it's, you see that this, it really has, it holds something in people because that fear is becoming more and more visible in society. Yeah, and I, th I think, of course, you know, the situation we're in right now, there are a lot of people that are, that are at home, and, um, and there's, there's, there's a, a deep-rooted fear in what's happening and, you know, going out. And, and I think a lot of people, that fear becomes panic. And then we've got these issues of panic buying and we've got these issues that are really affecting society as a whole. So I, I think it couldn't be more relevant. So again, I'd, I'd certainly recommend that people go and, and watch that TED Talk because you, you, you beautifully summarize it there, what, what you were talking about. But so getting to, to you sort of more personally, how has your life changed, if at, if at all, uh, during this pandemic then? So it was announced and suddenly you can't travel and go and exercise around the world. So what, what are you doing now? Well, again, I, um, you know, I, I don't want to sound so simplistic, but I think we have lost a lot of uh, simplicity. And this has simplified life, but uh, in a good way. You know, uh, instead of tra having to get on a plane and travel, well, I do talks now uh, uh, via Zoom, or I record a talk and I send it out to, uh, you know, to, to companies who have um, who have a need, let's say, to keep keep people keep perspective um, and not get caught up in this uh, pandemonia that that that's happening. You know, it's I I, I call this 
a lot of people say, oh, this is, this is going to be a recession. This is going to be this. I call this the great rebalancer. So what we're going through is we're, we're, we're rebalancing. This, this, this world is out of whack. And one of the four pillars is quality versus quantity. And, um, you know, I make the distinction between both. Quality is, is, is what you truly need in life, and quantity is just wants. It's based on wants. If you can't, if you can't quantify something, um, it's probably a need. It's definitely a need. If you can quantify it, it's a want. And it's okay to have wants, but we have been, we've gone through a world where um, I think a lot of us in companies, businesses, whatever it is, managers, they have been focused on quantity. You know, we, we, we have no metric system in this world to measure quality. In fact, we can't measure quality. It's not quantifiable. So our whole focus has been on quantity. And if your focus is 100% on quantity, well, then in a great, in, in a rebalancing era or in a, a rebalancing crisis, you're going to be affected. Yeah. But if, there's, if, if there's, there's a very, very good TED talk about that where um, the lady, I forgot who it is, but she talks about uh, the difference between economics of growth and economics of balance. And, you know, she's basically saying we need to veer away from this economic growth cycle and go towards an economic balance which and so it's it's very interesting you measure you talking and you know sebastian it's funny i've i've been doing these coffee interviews now for a little while and so many people are talking about you know this is returning to a balance so there's this consistent um message by people that have a very very good understanding of their own lives and their own purpose like yourself like leslie who i spoke to yesterday She's the sustainability queen. She's an amazing Irish lady. Um, and you're, you, know, you guys are all basically talking about the same thing of finding balance. And, and you're absolutely right. This has really forced us to, to look at ourselves and potentially figure out what that balance is. Um, so if you had a message, something that you wanted to tell people um, that are watching this right now, what, what would that be, Sebastian? Um. I think this is, again, this is a moment of opportunity. You know, this is, uh, um, this is, this is something where the, uh, the distinction, uh, we're going to be fed a lot of fear. We're going to be fed a lot of things that make us more and more fearful. Um, but the, the realization, the awareness, you know, being aware that um, there is actually very little danger around us. Um, if you, if you have smoked your whole life and you have asthma and you're, 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 you're older then yes, maybe you're in danger. You know, you have to be careful, but to think that, oh my gosh, I'm going to catch this virus and it's going to destroy me. That's 100% fear. And, and that fear causes you right now when there is, where there are so many rebalancing, uh, factors and opportunities that fear will hide those opportunities right. that fear will mask those opportunities and so the message is look try to eliminate and try to be aware of the difference are you in danger or is it fear it might seem simplistic but the more you eliminate fear the more you realize just using a little bit of logic that these are times where when things are rebalancing when things are getting put back into let's say uh order um well that's there's a lot of opportunities that emerge and the more fear you have, well, the less opportunities will, will, will emerge and you'll see. On the contrary, if you're already balanced, if you already see this as, as a moment of, okay, I might be in danger, but that danger is, is, uh, will, 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 not, will not feed me illusions and therefore I'll have a much clearer uh, vision of these, of, of these changing times. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's, you know, it might sound simplistic, but I see it in my own life. I mean, I've, I've never had, I've never had so many opportunities kind of fall on my lap. <laughs> and, uh, it's at, at one point you kind of feel, you kind of want to, you kind of feel, uh, like why are so many good things happening when around me, um, you know, I'm being fed that there's so much danger and horror and everything. Well, is, is, is it really, is it really a, a lot of horror around us or is it just a rebalancing that I'd like to, um, uh, be aware of, but not let it affect me too much. So, so when, when people get that focus, they can focus on the opportunities. And, and I, th I think that's, uh, 
That's, that's incredibly right. And while a lot of people are being optimistic, I think this isn't necessarily optimism. It's just, it's just a, a perspective. And people just need to judge. They need to figure a different perspective of looking at things, which, which don't entail fear. Well, d d danger, danger is reality. Yeah. So it, it, it actually, if you are in danger, it puts you in the present moment. It makes you mindful of the present moment. Fear is, has nothing to do with the present moment or reality. Remember, if you're not in danger, then your mind is already either in, in, the, fo in, in the future, so you have no idea whether it's going to happen or not. It's an illusion or it's in the past. Right. So being aware of danger, well, that makes you be very mindful. And if you're mindful, you're most likely able to make the right decisions or see the right opportunities. Right. If you have fear as the number one focus in your mind, well, you are focusing on the future or on the past. And those are two things that in the moment don't exist. Right. So your level of decision making is going to be really uh, penalized. Yeah. Your, your, your level of awareness is going to be incredibly handicapped because you're making decisions on things that don't matter. So right. a manager that's in fear, well, he's going to make a decision on his company or on the well-being of his employees or his team that is based on complete illusions. If you're in danger, you are in the moment, you are present, and you know, the reality of it will, will make you will increase the, the chances of you making the right decision. Right. If you are in fear, you are not in the present moment and therefore you decrease your chances of making the right decision. So you handicap yourself. Right. Sebastian, thank you very, very much. Um, I, didn't see you drink an, I, I didn't see you drink an awful lot of coffee, but, uh, but uh, oh, Team Bellin. So that's, that's uh, right. on, on your coffee cup. That's right, my, my wife, my wife uh, you know, uh, Make sure that I, I'm not a big coffee drinker, but in this case, in, in your honor, Dirk, I, I, uh, I was able to uh, take a few gulps of coffee. I, I actually took some from my wife's morning, uh, morning stockpile and uh, made myself a, a small cup of uh, coffee. So when's your, when's your next exercise, Sebastian? When, when are you getting out again? Um, today, I actually, I have 30K on the bike, but I do it, in, I do it here at home. And then um, I have 30, uh, 30K on the, the, um, uh, another machine that I use, a new step machine, which, which really uh, just focuses on my legs. Yesterday, uh, tomorrow, I, I might see you around, Derek, because I, I have a, a 16K run uh, tomorrow uh, in, in Traveran Forest. So uh, maybe we'll bump into each other. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty proud when I can do sort of between anywhere between 8 and 10K on my bike. So. <laughs> <laughs> you just put me to shame. I uh, right. I'm motivated. I'm going to get out there and do. I'm going to get up to the 30k mark. That's it, at least. Sebastian, Excellent. thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks again. My pleasure. Talk to you soon. Bye bye.